Father, we thank you for your word. We, we thank you for the gift of your spirit. And that where two or three gather together in your name, that you are in our midst. And your word says that you are enthroned in our praise. And you've said, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. And that, Lord, when we praise you, though our enemy come at us one way, he leaves out going seven ways. So we just thank you for the victory that's already been wrought in this service, Lord, as we have exalted the name that you have honored and given all authority and power to. And that is the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. And we come to you in his name. And we ask that you would open our ears and our hearts and our eyes to receive all, Lord, that you have for us. And we acknowledge that only your spirit can grant us revelation, knowledge, wisdom, spiritual understanding, conviction of truth, words of faith and salvation. So, Father, I ask that you would speak through me what you would have spoken, that your spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue, that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer, that I might write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word, removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever as we boldly declare that Satan is defeated We are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen again. And you may be seated, and some of you are already there. Hallelujah. (laughs) You had to get back in your seat before the memory foam forgot what it had shaped itself to. That's all we're going to say about that. Now, we read before the prayer in Matthew chapter number 24, and I want to go back there and look at something here. We're going to get into some uh, exciting things. I've been, man, I'm excited about this series. I'm excited about what the Lord's put on my heart to share with you in this service. We're we're, we're looking at at these parables that Jesus gives. We read before the prayer in in Matthew uh, chapter number 13, and forgive my run-on sentences. That's just what preachers do. But if, if if you look at verse number... 44, we'll back up. Jesus is, is laid out all these parables. The spiritual principle that, that the Lord wants to unveil through his word can only be unveiled by his spirit. That's so important that you understand that the Bible is, a, is, is spiritual. Jesus in John 6, 63, he said, the words I speak, they are spirit. They are spirit. When you read Daniel chapter 12, And God speaks through Daniel, and he writes out these prophecies. And Daniel is one of the last books in the Old Testament. And God spoke to Daniel, and he said these words. He said, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. For men shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And I know many people read that, and they they think that that seal is only upon the book of Daniel. But I believe that there is a spiritual seal on the full canon of God's word that it's only by his spirit that we really are able to see and to hear and our heart receive what he has for us. That's why at the very onset of these parables in Mark, Matthew 13, we see it also in Mark 4, but Jesus says in verse 9, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And he wasn't talking about the ability to naturally hear. He was saying, he that hath ears to hear, he that's able to receive what the Holy Spirit would unveil, let him receive it. And we're going to look at that echoed again in the book of Revelation in, in, in seven letters that Jesus wrote. So it's vital that every time we open the Word of God that we ask the Holy Spirit to unveil His Word to us. That's whether you're in service. That's whether you're studying at home, alone, in your own private time. You know, if, if you're opening the Bible and you say, I just don't get it. I can't get anything out of it. And you're telling on yourself. You're telling me you're not praying. Pray and ask the Lord to open His Word to you and, and, and I'm telling you that there's a benefit that comes to seeking the Lord and being desperate for his spirit to do something in your life. When you look at the Beatitudes that Jesus gave from the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in Matthew chapter number 5, the first Beatitude or the first blessing was this. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. 
I'm going to reiterate that. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Say that out loud. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. And that word poor is literally translated beggar. Blessed are the beggars in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. How many of us are willing to be beggars in the spirit? Because that's who he's saying that he opens his kingdom to, those that are beggars in the spirit. And I got to be honest with you, there are areas of my life that I don't have to beg or I don't beg like I used to beg. Ain't too proud to beg, sweet darling. <laughs> Hallelujah. And there are things in my life I, I, I used to would have to beg for, not that. There are things in my life I used to have to beg for, but I don't beg for anymore because the Lord has manifested himself in that area of my life. Shame on me. I know I started it when I said ain't too proud to beg. But at the same time, I found myself here in worship, and I'm sure somebody else did, where I was begging of the Lord. I'm asking the Lord for direction. I'm asking the Lord, Father, I could wake up in the morning and make many decisions and all of them be wrong. I could wake up tomorrow and make no decisions and that be wrong. But I want to be led by you. And your word says that you will order my steps in your word. Your word says that if I acknowledge you in all my ways, that you will direct my path. So, Father, I want to be led in peace and I want to go forward with joy. And I don't know what it is in your life that's got you begging where you're not too proud to beg, where you're willing to go before the Lord and say, Lord, I am desperate for you to move. I am desperate for you to, for you to, 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 to be the stay against my enemies. I am desperate for you to bring healing into my body. Lord, I'm desperate for you to bring reconciliation to my marriage. Lord, I am desperate for you to save my child or my children. Lord, I am desperate for you to do something because the weapon's been formed, but I know your word says it won't prosper. I don't know what it is in your life that's got you in prayer and in desperate Desperation, but I want you to know that God honors that. It's the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. And so when we take that position of need, when we take that position of desperation in prayer and in worship, and when we go into the word, the Lord throughout his word habitually shows us that he responds to expectation, that he responds to an atmosphere of desperation, hallelujah, that when we seek him, we find him. His word says, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened. Is that not what the word tells us, hallelujah? So, so when you look at these parables here in Matthew 13, and we're already understanding through the beginning by the first parable that Jesus taught in this chapter, that I need an ear to hear really what the Holy Spirit and God is saying to me. That's going to mean, and I'm going to show this to you. Oh, it's going to be good in this service right now. Th that means I've got to get myself in a position if I really want to hear from him and I really want to receive from his kingdom, I've got to get myself in a position where I'm not distracted. I've got to get myself in a position where I can hear from him. I can't say, Lord, I want to hear from you and then turn on all other kind of voices. I can't say, Lord, I really want to hear from you, but hold on a minute because I've got, I got, I got to see what this says right here. I've got to put myself in position to hear from him. There are times I'm driving down the road and most of the time I've got my worship on. I'm playing worship. Man, I got the Bluetooth connected to my phone. And I, I'm, you know, my, 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 my oldest son, he, he's on track with all of everything we sing and, and, and it's being sung. And, he, and, and man, he keeps me updated on all the stuff. And, 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 and between him and Jeremiah, I'm on point. But the other day I'm driving down the road and I felt like the Holy Spirit said, just turn it down. And I, I turned my, my, my worship down and I just needed that, I needed that moment of stillness and quiet. Not that God can't speak in a moment of worship because he can, but I just needed to hear nothing for a minute. And I mean, it was just for a, it was just for a little while. And then I put my worship back on, and then, man, I had, a, I had a different ear during worship. I needed a transition. I needed a selah. And when you read the book of Psalms, which is a book of worship, when you read the book of Psalms, which is literally the, a book of worship, you'll find this word that shows up again and again. It's selah. Selah, and it's a musical term. It means pause and think. Pause and think. It, it's a pause, and everybody needs that pause, that selah to say, okay, Lord, I need to hear from you. 
Lord, what is your will regarding this? Lord, I need a word from you. And I'm telling you that if we really want God to move when we congregate and we want the Lord to move in our lives, it has to go beyond just the minister, the pastor, or the platform. There's got to be a demand made from those that show up saying, Lord, I need you to move in this place tonight. I don't know if anybody else needs a word, but I need a word. And you come in with desperation, and then a word comes forward or a voice comes forward or, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit does something in you and then now you're like, oh, that, 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 that's what I needed, Lord. Thank you. And you know you've heard from God. If nobody else in the room got what they came for, you got what you came for. And I have witnessed so many times the Lord's strength being made perfect right in the midst of my weakness and I walk off this platform and know there was somebody that was making a demand on the Holy Spirit. There was somebody that was making a demand on that word and the Holy Spirit just poured that thing beyond my natural ability. Man, I don't want to be the, the first church of don't need nothing. I want to be the first church of desperation. The first church of begging and pleading and saying, God, I want you to move in my life in a way that only you can get the credit for. So watch these parables and we'll move forward. He says in verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure, treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So, imagine you finding something you didn't know you were looking for. Because that's what's happening in verse 44. This man has found something and he wasn't even looking. But what he found was worth everything that he had. And we're going to talk about this in a minute, so let this be the foundation. He was willing to make an exchange. What he found, he said, is worth what I have. And he was willing to make an exchange, saying, Lord, I give you what I have to receive what you have for me, the exchange. There was an exchange made. That, that's what the word buy means. But this man, as we talked about last week, and I shared that testimony because when the Lord saved me, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know I needed him. I wasn't really looking. I just went to church that day, you know, not to saying you can only find Jesus at church. I found Jesus at church. And he found me at church, and I wasn't even looking for him. I went there to get my, my aunt to leave me alone about getting me to go to church. She's been pestering me for nine months. I done had enough. Okay, I'll go, and then maybe next week when I come over to my uncle's house to look at the fish he caught down at the river, you won't come outside and pest me about going to church. I just came to see the fish. Because I'd fished all my life with my uncle. And that's what led me over to his house on a Saturday and where my aunt came out there on that front porch. And I'm looking, I'm up in the boat looking at the fish and the white perch and, and all this. And, and, and she harassed me by going to church. I went, found what I wasn't looking for, but it was worth everything I had in my life. Come on, somebody. And I ain't looked back since. I'm not going to look back. Verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking. Everybody say seeking. seeking. So notice the difference between this man and the previous man is the previous man wasn't even looking. He just came across something that he said is worth everything that I have. But this next man's actually seeking. I love these two parables because one is looking and the other isn't. But both are willing to give up everything they have for what they found. Hallelujah. And so... When, when this man is seeking, the word says in verse number 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found not a string of them, one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now I want to talk more about this pearl of great price because with everything in me, I believe that every one of you have a pearl of great price. That there is, there is something that God has for you if you will seek. Now, of course, it's his kingdom. And, of course, it, it derives out of his kingdom. But what pearl of great price does God have for you that you need to seek out? Now, I said this last week, but I want to say it again. What's interesting here is that he didn't find a diamond. Because a diamond's value is really established by man. 
because it's based on the choice. It's based on the cut. This value goes up by the work of man's hand. A pearl, on the other hand, is not the result of the work of a man's hand. It is the work of an organism. It is the work of an oyster in a shell that's been irritated. Wait till we talk about that. Come on, somebody. Because there would never be a pearl where they're not an oyster. But not just an oyster, an oyster that had gotten irritated. Because that's how pearls are produced. They are produced out of irritation. When a, a debris or when sand or some type of morsel gets inside the oyster's shell, it makes that oyster uh, uh, uncomfortable. And, and in its discomfort, one of its two membranes begins to release a serum. And that serum is, is produced by agitation. And, and, and it's released on that granule of sand or whatever it is that's irritated it. And over a period of time, that serum produces what we know to be a pearl. So were the oyster not, not, not pricked in its side, were the oyster not, had the oyster not faced trial and trouble, then that pearl would have never been produced. And there is something that the Lord by his spirit wants to produce in your life. And you've got to be willing to seek it and you've got to be willing to trade what's in your life for that thing that God has for you. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Go with me to Revelation chapter number three. Revelation chapter number three. And we'll talk more about that pearl and the production of the pearl later. But I want to go to Revelation three. Now, <clears throat> The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. My testimony is, is that when the Lord first opened his word to me that changed my life after salvation, I was desperate. That was the most desperate I've ever been in my life. I, I was at the point of not wanting to live. Suicidal in my thought. And it was in that desperation that I began to see the word in a way that I'd never seen it before. Now, I'm not asking anybody to get at the end of your rope or get so low the only place you can look is up. I didn't say none of that. I said, this is my testimony. And I don't know what it is that's going on in your life that might push you to a place where you're desperate to find the will and plan for God, but I want you to know there is, there is something to seeking God with all of your heart because when you seek God out of desperation, you, there's a willingness to make an exchange for his perfect will and his perfect plan for whatever it is that you have in your life. And in both of those par parables that we read about, there was one man that was not seeking and there, there was one man that was, but what they found was worth an exchange. They were willing to give up what they had for what the Lord had for them. I mean, just after last Wednesday, when we talked about these, the, the, these two scenarios, one man seeking, the other not, but both willing to give up everything for what they had. Last night after church, I literally had a conversation with two men where the one was not seeking, didn't want to hear the word, aggravated that his wife was hearing the word, didn't want to have nothing to do with me or this place. Mm-hmm. And then there was another, another brother I, I, I visited with after church last Sunday night. Seven years seeking. Seven years desperately seeking the will of God. Seven years. It led him to visit here. It, 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 now, now, he's, now he's a member. Now, now he's plugged into our academy. Now he, now he oversees our basketball program. Stroh Miles Swift, seven years seeking the will of God up on the front row now. Come on, somebody. The, 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 he don't like me talking about, but I had to, brother. But here's the thing is that not everybody has the same backstory. You might be the one you weren't looking. You might be the one like, Pastor, I've been looking for longer than seven years. But I want you to know that the, he, he's such a good God that when he opens up his plan for your life, it puts you in a position where you can make a decision, Lord, do I want this? And the key to saying I want it, that pearl of great price, that thing that, that God has set before you, his will, his plan, his salvation, his wholeness in your life, his blessing, when you see it, are you willing to take everything you have and say, Lord, none of this can compare to what I get from you? So watch this in Revelation 
chapter number 3. When you get there, say amen. amen. All right. Now, in Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus is addressing seven different churches. And in all seven cases, he says something we looked at, I think, last week. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, watch verse 14. And man, this is just wait till just wait till you see this. And I know the Holy Spirit's gonna open up for you. Verse 14 of Revelation 3. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. So Jesus here is addressing the church of Laodicea. He says, write this. These things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. I'm going to explain that here in a minute. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesal, that thou mayest see. Now, let me just stop right there. So far, Jesus has brought up Luke being lukewarm. He's brought up wealth and being increased with goods, and he's, bought, he, he's brought up uh, the ability to put something on their eyes that would let them see. Jesus is not just pulling stuff out of the air as he addresses the church of Laodicea. Because if you go and research the city of Laodicea and you look at its history and its architecture, you find that this city's main issue was its lack of water. That they had to literally pipe canal water into the city from hot springs that were roughly 60 miles away, six miles away. <clears throat> and by the time the hot springs that were the source of the Laodiceans' water got to Laodicea, it was a lukewarm. The, tr the, the, the route, the six-mile journey of the water from the source had cooled it down, but not cool enough that it would really satisfy your thirst. It had a lot of sulfur in it. So it was, it was nasty to drink. They had bad water, and it was lukewarm water. You know, you want your, you, you know, if you make a tea, you might want your water hot. But if you thirsty, you want your water cold. Their water was all, was never cold, but never hot, lukewarm. So Jesus is addressing th what they would have been familiar with, their water. Then he addresses how they say they don't need anything. That's because Laodicea was like the banking capital of the region. It was known for its wealth. It, it, was, it was known for its prosperity, it was, it was a place where the banks were located. It was a place of great wealth, and travelers would travel through Laodicea, and marketers would show up, and merchants would be there. It was a place that was just packed with prosperity. And, 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 and listen, the, 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 the bling was all over the place. And if, and, and if it was to be desired, you could get it at Laodicea. So it was an abundant place. It was a place of prosperity, but lukewarm water. It was also a place of a medical school. It was a place where they had invented a powder that could be used to treat the eyes. So Jesus is bringing up everything they had going on in their region. He's saying, when he brought up lukewarm water, he's saying, I, I see the water you drink. When he brought up the gold and, and all the wealth, he was saying, I see what you're nested in. When he brought up the eye salve, he was saying, I know what you got. I know what you got. My point is, is that when Jesus addresses you, he knows what you're living in. He knows what your circumstance is. He knows where your strengths are, and he knows what your weaknesses are. Because here he dealt with the strengths of Laodicea, but he also dealt with their weaknesses like their water. And that They themselves would spew out of their mouth. He's saying, I know what you got. I know what your living conditions are. I know what's going on in your apartment. I know what's going on in your city. I know what's going on on your job. I know how much money you've got in your bank account. I know what's going on in your relationships. I am aware of everything that's going on in your life. That's what Jesus was saying to the church of Laodicea. 
Now, what was his counsel? Counsel is advice. What was his counsel? He said, I counsel thee to buy of me. Read that part out loud. I counsel thee to buy of me. Read that one more time. I want you to sink in. Ready? Read. I counsel thee to buy of me. What's he saying? I know what your water system provides. I know what your banking system provides. I know what your territory provides. I know what clothing you can buy down at the market. I know what, 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 what your medical school offers. I know what you got in your own backyard, but I'm counseling you, Jesus said, to buy of me. I want you to look past everything you have in your life, and I want you to look at me as the source of your life. I've got something for your life that's not located right down the street. I've got something better than your lukewarm water. I've got something better than your banks of gold. I've got something better than the, than, the, than the advancement of your medical school. I've got what you really need because your school may have opened your natural eye, but I will open your spiritual eyes. And your markets may have given you the best looking clothes, but they've not hidden your shame. You can live a life and put on the right clothes and still not cover your shame. And you look like you got it all together. And your tailor-made suit, you look good. But no amount of money you put on that suit has been able to cover up what you've done in this body. Because there's a shame that nobody else sees that you wear. And it explains your disposition. It explains your depression. It explains your fear. It explains the way you think. There's a shame that you bear that your clothes don't cover up. What Jesus was saying to the church of Laodicea is you got gold, but you're still broke. You've got clothes, but you're still shame. You've got eyesight, but you still can't see. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? He's saying that everything that this world offers us is a facade. It doesn't really address the real issue of the soul. When Jesus said, what does it profit if a man gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's what he meant. It doesn't mean that you can't profit in the world or that, or that you can't have things. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and it'll add no sorrow with it. And there's nothing wrong with you having things as long as things don't have you. But my point is, is there's no thing in this world. There is no thing that your money can buy, that your bank can lend you the money to buy. There is nothing you can buy down at the mall or on Amazon that will cover up the guilt and the shame and the, and, and the, and the brokenness of your heart and your soul. Only Jesus can resolve that. So, so Jesus says here in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me. I know what the Laodiceans offer you, but I want you to buy something of me. I, I, know, I know what hanging around all the right people is offering you, but I want you to get something from me. I know what you think going down to that school is giving you, but I want you to get something from me. Oh, Hallelujah. I counsel thee to buy of me. Jesus saying, make me your source. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. So we see, he's saying, I want you to be really rich. And I got gold that is pure gold. And it won't, it won't, it won't, it won't uh, stain your skin when you're weary. He said, I want, I, want, I, want to get you, I want to give you gold that's been tried in the fire that you can really be rich. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. He's not talking about the clothes that they would buy down at the market. He's talking about a covering that only he could give them. And that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. That those uncovered areas in our lives, those, when you're uncovered, you're vulnerable. When you're uncovered, you're vulnerable. That's why, the, you know, that's why the enemy wants to keep us uncovered. We're vulnerable. You're supposed to be startled if you ain't clothed real good and, and somebody uh, opens the door. You're supposed to, hey, cover that up. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Let me get something. Let me get something. On. Hold on a minute. You go find, you know, a, a house coat or something. Uh, you you, you want to be covered. Listen, Jesus is saying when, when, 
I want you to get my clothing. I have a white raiment that when you're clothed with, the shame of your nakedness does not appear. I'm not talking about natural clothes. Jesus is saying, you are vulnerable in so many areas because you haven't let me cover you. You've got areas that nobody can touch, and when they get touched, you get all broken, but I want to cover those areas. I want to cover that up so you're not so vulnerable. Hallelujah. Do you know one of the words that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit was the comforter? <clears throat> and we pull a comforter when we, wanna, when we want warmth. We throw the comforter on, you know, when our external circumstances, you know, uh, uh, need to be changed. Hallelujah. And, and, and God is saying by his spirit, he can be your comforter. Hallelujah. That no matter what the temperature may be, he can regulate it in your life so it's not affecting you. He, he's talking about being clothed in his spirit and being clothed in his anointing and being clothed in his grace so you're not vulnerable and open to the enemy so that whatever it was that was open before that the enemy used that brought shame, it doesn't have to bring shame anymore. Yeah. Hallelujah. There, there are things that our language and our manners and the way we carry ourselves and clothe ourselves there are things that can go in the heart of man that none of that will ever, care, will ever cover. That, that guilt, that shame can only be covered by redemption. It can only be covered by the blood of Jesus and by his grace and his goodness. That, Lord, you would cover my shame. That you would cover my shame so, so that my history no longer defines my destiny. So that I don't have to be identified by what I did in my body three years ago. That I'm not, I'm not that person anymore. That you have redeemed me. And your mercies are brand new every morning. And, and your blood has redeemed me from that. And I may not be what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. And I know that I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. And old things are passed away. And all things have become brand new. So, Lord, whatever it is I got in my life that I need to give to you, I'll give it to you just to have what you have have for me so there was a daddy that gave his little girl a string of artificial pearls that she had seen down at the drugstore and 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 she wanted them pearls so bad and so the daddy bought her the pearls and, man, she loved them pearls. She wore those pearls all the time. She'd dress up, you know, put her mama's shoes on, look in the mirror and put them pearls on. Man, she loved those pearls. She wore those pearls all the time, just loved the pearls, dressed up with the pearls. One day her daddy went to her and she said, he said, baby, you know those pearls I got you down at the drugstore? She said, yeah, daddy. He said, I want them. She said, daddy, I love those pearls. He said, I know you do, but I, I need them back. She said, why, why, daddy? Well, I just need you to trust me. I want you to give me them pearls. You trust daddy? You love me? Yeah, daddy, you know I love you. Give me the pearls. I need them back. But daddy, did I not take good enough care of them? Oh, no, you took real good care of those pearls. Well, I didn't break them, daddy. I know you didn't break them. You're not in trouble. Just, just trust daddy and give me them pearls. Big old tear swells up in her eyes. She gives her daddy those pearls. At that time, Daddy reaches, and he pulls out a little box. He said, here you go, baby. This is for you. And she opens up, and it's real pearls. He said, you know what? You did so good with the fake ones. You look so beautiful in the ones that weren't real. And you took such good care of these ones we spent just a couple of dollars on. I had to go and buy you the real thing. Listen, we have to be willing to trust our Father. That when he's taking something out of our life, it's only because he's got something better to go in its place. You've never offered anything to God. You've never given anything to him that he didn't have something better that was coming right back at you. That's what he was saying to the church of Laodicea. You think you got wealth. You think you've got clothing. You think you've got all the answers. Come to me. Make me your source. Buy of me. Let me give you something that will outlast, outdo, outperform, outvalue anything this world has ever offered you. That's what Jesus is saying. And that's what the man who found the pearl of great price did. He sold all that he had, and he said, Lord, I want this. Hallelujah. He said, and I'm closing verse 18. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me 
Church, what do you have right now that you've not bought of the Lord? What do you have in your life but, but, but you've not bought anything from him? What do you have in your life that's made you so comfortable that you've stopped praying? You used to pray the mortgage in. You used to pray your rent money in. But now that you moved into that big house and your bills are paid, you don't pray like you used to. What, what are you not asking God for? Because you now have something in your own life. You got the degree. You got the marriage. You, you, you're living good. What have you stopped praying for? What have you stopped seeking God for? When did he stop being the source? Why did it take you needing something to get you to pray? When's it gonna ta- what's it going to take for you to go back and say, Lord, I just want you. There's nothing in my life more important than you. The money doesn't matter. The house doesn't matter. The car doesn't matter. The job doesn't matter. The degree doesn't matter. I need you, Lord. What is your will for my life? I am desperate for you to be glorified in me. When the church can get to that position, revival will sweep the nation. But as long as the enemy is showing us the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and our needs are met, and our bills are paid, and our bellies are full, and we we wait till the next crisis to pray, how is revival going to sweep? Because we've said, Lord, I don't have to pray because I'm too comfortable. I don't have to pray because I'm too healthy. I don't have to pray because things are too good. And those things should not motivate you to seek your father in the first place. And I'm only bringing up those things because Jesus is bringing these things up. He's bringing up the clothing. He's bringing up the wealth, the gold. He's bringing these things up. He's saying it is these things that you have that have stopped you from buying of me. He said, I counsel thee, I'm I'm advising you, I'm I'm, I'm pleading with you, buy of me. What have you sold out the Lord for in your life? And you know you're not going to bed whole. You know you're not waking up happy. You know you're miserable in your heart because you sold out the Lord for something that Satan said would satisfy you just like he lied to Eve. He's lied to you and told you that God held out on you and that God's not giving you the best fruit and that God didn't give you the best husband and that God didn't give you the best life and if you'll just eat of this fruit then you'll, you're, you'll have wisdom then your eyes will be open then you'll taste and, and see what you've been missing but just like Eve once you eat of the fruit you realize I really wasn't missing nothing it don't taste like he said it would taste it don't feel as good as he said it would feel it wasn't worth my soul And I know there's somebody in here right now that will tell you that they have sold out the Lord's counsel and advice to go receive what Satan offered and they will tell you it's not worth it. But sadly, there are some of you that are still being lured by the enemy's lie. And that that little conversation you're having outside of your marriage is harmless because he's not listening to you. But it is it, It is harmful. And that stuff you're taking home from the job, you should take home because they don't pay you enough anyway. Uh Uh-huh, I hit one on that one, didn't I? So all of a sudden, the enemy says, you've got to lose your integrity. You've got to to forget your faithfulness. You've got to remove all honor. And you've got to degrade yourself to, 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 to lust and perversion and robbery. And that's what you've got to resort to if you really want to be happy. I can't tell you how many times I've heard folks say, I, I just want to be happy. But, but that lie that the enemy gives you about what will make you happy that never makes you happy. He, he, he can, he, listen, the enemy can, 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 can lay it out before you but he can never make it good. He writes bad checks. You can't take what he gives you to the bank. It will bounce on you every time. And once he lures you into sin and you leave all the advice and all the counsel that God has, once you leave all that and you, and you step into what the enemy has, then you realize you've only been trapped by sin and sin always takes you further than you wanted to go. Sin always keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. And sin always costs you more than you ever thought you would pay. 
But if that's you and you've been there and you say, now what? I'm saying to you, you can turn back to the Lord, the true lover of your soul. You can turn to him right now and say, you know what, Lord? Everything I have in my life, I lay it down at your feet. Everything I have in my life, I surrender it, Lord. If it's not of you, take it out of me. I want your will in me. He doesn't want you naked, and he doesn't want you begging for food. But that's what it took for the prodigal son to realize he needed to go home to his daddy's house. Daddy, give me everything I got coming to me. He took all the wealth and squandered it in riotous living. And when he came to his senses, eating out of a dumpster, he said, my father's servants have it better than me. I'll go back to daddy's house and I'll say, Father, just make me a servant. And as he came up the driveway and his father saw him, the father ran to him and kissed him. He said, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me a servant. He said, not so. He looked at his hand and saw that the insignia ring, the ring that that would would have the family crest, the ring that gave him power and and, and, and honor, he was sold probably in some pawn shop. He said, go get him a ring. Go put the family crest back on his hand. He's still my child. What's he wearing? Go get him a robe. Go get him a robe. He don't hardly have nothing on. Put, 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 put a robe back on him. Oh, look at him. He's done lost too much weight. Kill the fatted calf. Kill the fatted calf. Daddy, it's not Thanksgiving. Kill the fatted calf. It is Thanksgiving. I'm thankful my son just came home. And he threw a party. And that's what the Father wants to do for you. Everything you've been running around and trying to get in this world, he's saying, just come to me because I got a better version of it. It'll endure and it won't bring shame and it won't bring guilt. The blessing of the Lord, it'll make rich but not bring the sorrow. You lay down with the wrong person, you wake up and you got, you got guilt and you got shame. But when you lay down with your wife and get up, you're happy. You can smile about it. You can stay the night. You can wake up with her in the morning time. Why? Because marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. You are selling yourself out for something that's not even making you whole. Get back to Jesus. Get back to his work. Get back to his way and find wholeness in your mind, in your body, and in your spirit. There is a pearl that's waiting on you. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, by your spirit, show us our pearl. By your spirit, Lord, show us the pearl. Help us to discover the pearl of great pearl. Every head bowed, just a moment. I'm not going to keep you much longer, just a moment. I just know, I just know I'm talking to somebody. And Jesus wants to cover what you can't cover up. You've been putting a facade out there. Even on social media, you you put all the right posts. You put your highlight reel out there. But you're not showing us what's going on in between posts. Because what we're seeing on that highlight reel is not real. It's a cover up. You know you're drinking water that makes you vomit. And you know those clothes aren't covering your shame. And you know that outside is it opening your eyes? Because never has your vision been more distorted than it is right now. Some of you got distorted vision. I'm talking to that man that's thinking about leaving his wife. Don't you let your eyes be distorted. I'm talking to somebody that's compromised their integrity and tried to justify it. I'm 
Don't let this world lure you in and convince you it's of more value than what Jesus has for you. Because there have been many that have walked that road. And it's only left them broken. Jesus, be my pearl. Be my pearl. And if you've got to use what's irritating me right now, I know you're working toward an end that's to my benefit. But be my pearl. Be my pearl of great price. And if something else has gotten my attention, annoy my eyes so I can see you. Every head bowed, you ask the Lord. What do you need to give up? What do you need to stop putting your confidence and trust in? Good paying jobs don't guarantee righteous children. Big homes don't promise happy marriages. Nothing wrong with a good paying job. Nothing wrong with a big home. I live in one. But it's what's going on inside that home. It's of the greatest value whether the house is big or small. Don't let the comforts of this world cause you to lose the value of the pearl. And Jesus knew it would happen because in Deuteronomy 8, he said, when you've dwelt in the land that I promised you, when you've built goodly houses and dwelt therein, when you've eaten and art full, don't forget the Lord that brought you out of bondage. Don't have a full belly and forget the God you called out on when you were hungry. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I make a decision. to listen to your counsel, your word and your spirit, and to bow to you. I acknowledge you offer me things this world cannot provide. I seek your kingdom. Your joy, your righteousness, your peace, your wholeness above anything I have in my life. I know the water I provide is lukewarm compared to the living water you provide. my money nor my desire for it could ever make me whole but your blessing it makes rich and adds no sorrow nothing I wear could ever cover 
the condition of my heart, my soul. Only you can cover me. So Jesus, I acknowledge you tonight as my pearl of great price. From this moment till I walk out of here tonight, begin to reveal to me what I need to take my eyes off of. that I might see you. In Jesus' name. Oh, amen.